Hello, this is Mr. Daniels again. We are in Freak the Mighty Chapter 8, titled Dinosaur Brain. Uh, we have no guest speaker today. Uh, we have just finished the chapter with uh, Chapter 6 and 7 with the encounter with Blade. And uh, the aftermath of that is actually pretty cool. So let's move on. It turned out to be a pretty cool summer. I figured we'd get in trouble for running into the pond. It looked bad for a while when the cops drove us home and I got out all soaking wet, covered with gook. And when Grim was hosing me down, he had this real pruny look on his face like he was smelling something really bad. But the cops made out like I was a hero or something, rescuing the poor, crippled midget kid. So Grim listens to the cops and he gives me this weird look like, imagine my surprise. And goes into the house and Grim comes running out in her nightgown with this big fluffy towel. And she may really makes a fuss. Me rescuing Freak? Ha ha ha! What a joke, right? Except that's how it must have looked from a distance. Because they never knew it was Freak who rescued me! Or his genius brain and my big dumb body. Grandma's there rubbing me with a towel and her hands are shaking and she's saying, Oh, I saw those blue lights and I thought the worst! And Grandma's right behind me looking real intense, shaking his head and he's saying, Who'd have thunk it, Mabel? Which is some kind of a joke, because Graham's name isn't Mabel. Anyhow, they take me inside. The first thing Graham does is give me a bowl of ice cream. And Graham keeps shaking his head, and he goes, What this young man needs is a cup of coffee. Real coffee. And then he gets putting, busy putting the filter in the machine and measuring out the coffee, standing by while it drips through. And he's got this stern look like he's thinking deep thoughts. By the time I polish off the ice cream, Grim is handing me coffee in a china cup from the set they never use. He gives me that cup like it's a really big deal, maybe because I'm not allowed to drink coffee yet, and he's so Grim-like and serious, and I open my mouth to say, what's the big deal? You think this is my first cup of coffee? <laughs> yeah, right. And something happens, and the words come out, thank you, sir, and it's like I'm possessed or something, and I have no idea what to think. Things I'm saying are coming from her wife. I go, thanks for the telegram and the ice cream. Could I have sugar in the coffee? Two teaspoons, please. And Grim claps his hands together and he says, of course you can, son. And it's like, whoa, -ho! because he never calls me that. It's always Max or Maxwell or that boy. Next thing, he's clearing his throat, coughing into his fist, and Graham is looking at the two of us, and she gets this Graham-like glow, like, this is how it's supposed to be. The waste thing always happened on the Wonder Years, with the family getting all gooey and sentimental about the numb thing that Braddy Kid did, while he's having all his wonderful years or whatever. Graham says, I want you to promise me something, Maxwell, dear. Promise me you'll keep away from the hoodlum boy and his awful friends. Nobody got hurt this time, but I shudder to think what might have happened. And Grim, bless his pointed little head, he goes, Maxwell can handle himself, can't you? Ah, Max? Right. Uh, Max. Not son. Mmm, which is okay by me. Well, I can run, I say to Graham. I see Tony D, that's what I'll do. Good boy, Graham says. I thought because you're so much bigger than he is. Mm, well, you just do that, dear. You run away. He's not running away, Graham says, real impatient. He's taking evasive action. Avoiding a confrontation. That's a very different thing. Right, Max? I nod and drink my coffee without slurping and decide it's better not to mention that Tony D carries a knife and he's probably got guns, too. Because then Graham would only worry and she's such a clunker when she's worried. Like I said, turns out to be a pretty cool summer. Usually what I do is just hang around and look at the comic books or watch the tube, or go shopping with Graham if she really makes a fuss. I hate the beach because the beach is stupid. The cool crowd looking sleek and tanned and aren't we gorgeous? Because if you saw me lying on a blanket, you'd go, hey, why is that albino walrus wearing sunglasses? So mostly I just vegetate in the basement and pick my navel, to quote Grimm, Mr. Belly Button Lent himself. But Freak changes all that. Each and every morning, little dude humps himself over. He bangs on the bulkhead, waka waka waka. And he may be small, but he sure is noisy. Get out of bed, you lazy beast! They're fair maidens to rescue! Dragons to slay! 
which is what he always says every single morning. Exactly the same thing, until it's like he's the alarm clock, and as soon as I hear the waka 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 of him beating on the bulkhead, I know what's coming next. Fair Maidens and Dragons, and Freak, with that wake-up-the-world grin of his going, Hurry up with the cereal! How can you eat so much, you big ox? Come on, let's do something! He's so full of everyday energy, you can practically hear his brain humming, and he can never sit still. Ants in the pants, I say one morning when he's ready to yank the cereal bowl off the table. He's in such a hurry to do something, and he goes, What? And I go, you must have ants in your pants. And he gets this funny look and he goes, That's what the fair Gwen always says. Did she tell you to say that? And I shake my head and finish the cereal real slow. And Freak goes, For your information, there are 2,247 known subspecies of the hypertermian insects, Latin name Formicetti, and none of them are in my pants. Which cracks me up, even though I don't understand a word he's saying. I propose a quest, he says. We shall journey to the, to the east and see what lies there. By now, what a, I know what a quest is, because Freak has explained the whole deal, how it started with King Arthur trying to keep all the knights busy by making them do things that proved how strong and brave and smart they were, or sometimes how totally numb. Because how else can you get explained dudes running around inside big, clunky tin cans praying all the time? Which I don't mention to Freak, because he's sensitive about knights and quests and secret meanings. Like how a dragon isn't just a big slimy fire-breathing monster, it's a symbol of nature or something. A dragon is fear of the natural world, Freak says. An archetype of the unknown. I go, what's an archetype? And Freak sighs and shakes his head and reaches into his knapsack for his dictionary. This is true. He really does keep a dictionary in his knapsack. It's his favorite book, and he pulls it out like Arnold Schwarzenegger pulling out a machine gun or something. That's the fierce look he gets with the book in his hands. Go on, he says, making me take the book. Look it up! And now I wish I hadn't said anything about this archetype, do it, because I hate looking stuff up in his stupid dictionary. Start with A, he says. I know that. A, R, he says. Just go along the A so they come to the A, R. Yeah, right. Easy for a genius to use the dictionary since he already knows how to spell the words. And R's never look like backwards E's to freak. Which is the way they sometimes look to me unless I really squint to think about it. Careful, he says. You'll bite off your tongue and then we'll have to waste a day at the emergency room to get it reattached. Microsurgery is such a bore. Didn't anybody ever tell you that? Huh? I say. But I do close my mouth so my tongue doesn't stick out. I'm still looking in the dictionary for archetype, and I'm looking for the words that are underlined with red ink because that's what Freak does the first time he looks up a word. He makes a line under it, and you'd be amazed how many underlined words there are. There are whole pages like that where he's looked up every single word. Finally, he spells out all the letters for me, and I find the stupid word. There's nothing about dragons here, I say. Squinting hard at the stuff under the word. It just says pattern. So what is this? A sewing type of thing? Freak has this disgusted look. And he takes the dictionary and he goes, You're hopeless. Pattern is the first definition. I was referring to the second definition. Which is much more interesting. A universal symbol or idea in the psyche. Expressed in dreams or dreamlike images. <laughs> like that helps, right? I'm getting bored with the dictionary, so I pretend to understand, and Freak finally gives up and shakes his head and goes, I don't know why I bother. Dinosaurs had the brains the size of peanuts, and they ruled the Earth for a hundred million years. All right, looking at the time, we, are, uh, we still have some time for a quick discussion here. I want you to think about these questions as you read through this chapter here. Uh, first and foremost, uh, back at the beginning of chapter 8, I want you to think about the way Max was treated by Grimm and Graham. Uh, I, I wonder how that felt like, you know, just being in his shoes, sitting there having the coffee, the ice cream. Do you guys ever have that same moment where you are uh, maybe coddled by mom or dad? And uh, what about the part where, where Grimm uh, calls Max son? How many people caught that as like a pretty important line? Do you think that makes Max feel special? I uh, I truly think that uh, that Max almost feels like a true son of Grimm because Grimm has taken on that role of father in his life for so many years now. 
Um, moving on to the end of the chapter, uh, I, I, I do like the ending and uh, um, the dictionary. You know, if you go back to the, uh, the way that Max says, and R's never looked like backwards E's to freak, um, what is that talking about right there? We, we studied this in, my, in uh, the, the, the front-loading unit because he's talking exactly about his dyslexia that he has and how, uh, how silly he thinks he is. Um, I wonder, you know, putting myself in Max's shoes, what would it be like talking to Freak? Would I feel um, inadequate? Would I not understand things? Yes, I probably would. And uh, it's got to be frustrating to know how much Freak's brain is humming and how Max is just sitting there totally lost. And uh, I think Freak has so many things that he can give Max, and Max is realizing that uh, uh, this friendship that they are indeed building uh, is... Uh, is possibly could be used to help him uh, in school. And uh, I don't know. Do you guys think that that might happen? Um, I'm hoping that uh, that Freak does find a way to get Max better and give him some self-confidence because, quite frankly, that is what Max needs so very desperately. So uh, I thank you so much for listening here. And um, I would like to reward anybody who is uh, reading this chapter right now. If you're reading this chapter at home, online, uh, first person, to come mention to me that you read chapter 8. Chapter 8 is the chapter. And uh, uh, come to me. I will give you my chair for the day. Sit comfy in the teacher's chair. Uh, you'll be sitting pretty while the rest of the class is dying in those hard chairs. Just let, let me know that you uh, read chapter 8. And uh, God bless you guys. Have a great night.